This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN, and it will contain spoilers for Zack Snyder's Justice League and a bunch of other DC films. Okay, really quick, before you yell at me in the comments, please know that this video is not going to be me frantically shouting about how Zack Snyder's cut of the Justice League was terrible and all the DC films were bad or anything like that. I think Snyder's Justice League is a significant, significant improvement over the original. There are excellent moments and fun action scenes, and there's a bird outside right now that's extremely extremely loud. Do you mind? Sorry, thank you. I really liked getting to see more interactions between Cyborg and his dad. A Flash going to rewind time and save everyone is genuinely excellent. Plus, they kept Aquaman saying, Amen. And they added a cute scene where Alfred is super particular about how tea is made, which is perfect for me because I'm also picky about proper tea preparation. First, go ahead and grab your favorite NerdSync mug that you can get at nerdsyncstore.com, link in the description. Yes, I've been squatting right there for hours, just waiting for someone to walk by. Thank you for taking your time. Next, go ahead and add some English breakfast tea. Right, oh, right, and right there, no, right. First try. Someone get dude perfect on the phone. Go ahead and add a little bit of sugar to that. Next, I would add a couple of freshly cracked cardamom pods. I don't have that here, but it makes it a very delicious try if that's what you're going for. Bloop, bloop. We'll get it in post. And this is the important part. Make sure to pour in water that's around 160 degrees Fahrenheit or 71 Celsius. So we don't scold the tea. For black tea, I let it steep for precisely three minutes and 20 seconds. I built a custom shortcut on my watch for this because I am that kind of nerd. If you want the cardamom route, make sure to scoop out those pods after that timer is done. You get it. Take out the tea. I typically like to spin it around the spoon and just squeeze out the bag. I know people will hate me for that. Add a little bit of soy milk because I'm a lefty soy boy. Give it a good stir and enjoy. And by enjoy, I mean set it down somewhere and completely forget that you even made tea until hours later where you see it sitting on the counter and now it's ice cold and that bums you out. Speaking of things that bum me out, when I was watching this movie, there was one small thing that bothered me. Okay, there was more than one thing, but this one stuck with me for whatever reason, from the moment it happened to the very end of the film, which occurs at exactly the three hour and 40 minute mark. There's nothing after that, and people who tell you that there is are mistaken. So here's my issue. Superman's black costume doesn't make any sense, and it bothers me more than it should, but... I know how to fix it. Look at this glare right here, right? Shiniest head in the business. Now here's the thing, I can't promise you a specialized costume to protect you from universe ending threats, but if you want a tool to protect yourself online, you need a VPN. And the one that I recommend is Surfshark. Now you probably already know that VPNs can keep your web browsing secure and even block ads, malware, and tracking, which is huge. I do not like people, especially my internet service provider, tracking what I do online. I would prefer it if they looked the other way while I do my personal things. Oh yeah, that's pretty good. Other than wanting to look at big sandwiches in peace, the other best reason to use a VPN, in my opinion, is the ability to use the internet in restrictive countries and to access content that is only available in countries outside of the one that you are physically in. It's like an actual magic trick. With one click, suddenly, I'm in Argentina, which is basically right next door to the Sandwich Islands. So if you're in a country that doesn't have access to uh, Disney+, Plus, for example, you can use Surfshark VPN, change your location to a country that does have Disney+, Plus, and then you can watch this episode of Boy Meets World where Corey learns about sandwiches. The Earl of Sandwich. You don't suppose? Yes! He did invent the sandwich. I wrote this whole ad bit before I ate lunch, can you tell? Surfshark is available on pretty much every platform, including computers, and phones I have it turned on all the time, and it just makes browsing the internet so much better. Uh, if you go to the link in the description, you can get an 83% discount and three extra months for free if you use the promo code SUPERSUIT. Save enough money to buy yourself a nice sandwich. Again, the link in the... <laughs> I forgot that I wrote that. Again, use the link below and use the promo code SUPERSUIT to get an 83% discount, unlocking the best price in the market, plus three extra months 
for free. Huge shout out to Surfshark for continuing to sponsor my channel and making a VPN that I use literally every day. How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, first video of the year now that it's April, oh God. But like I said, I'm not gonna start this year off negatively. I'm not gonna be mean about a small detail in a movie. We're gonna have fun with it. Have, have fun with me. That's an order. I demand you have fun with me. Now, before I fix Superman's black costume, I should probably explain the problems that I have with this suit. I don't hate the design, right? I actually like it a lot. It's sleek and rad and definitely a lot cooler than this Halloween costume I picked up a couple years ago at a yard sale. That's debatable. But that's really all there is to the black suit, right? It just looks cool. But the problem is, if you can call it a problem, uh, film, is a visual language. Things on screen have meaning, whether the author intends them or not. It's a motion picture, like the whole point is, it's an image that tells a story, you know? That's the most important thing. So let's quickly go look at Superman's role in the movie Justice League to see kind of what this suit is trying to tell us. The film starts with Superman dying, a great place for any character to start their journey, and Justice League explores the character of Superman, not just as the big guns that they need to save the world, but as a symbol of hope, yeah, Superman punches real hard, and that's neat, but it's not the only reason why they want to bring him back to life. The League views Superman as a bright spark of morale to restore peace to Earth and save the planet from the evils of Steppenwolf and Darkseid. Heck, not even the planet, the, the whole universe. In short, Superman is not just a weapon. He's a shining symbol of hope. That is what the S symbol on his chest represents after all. What's the S stand for? It's not an S. On my world, it means hope. So Superman showing up during the final battle against Steppenwolf is supposed to be this triumphant moment that boosts everyone's spirits. In a sense, Superman is a character who can do almost anything, but his real superpower is making you feel like you can do anything. Superman doesn't use his immense power for selfish or destructive desires. Everyone thinks he's going to, right? That's been the plot line of Man of Steel. How do we know you won't one day act against America's interests? I grew up in Kansas, General. Batman v Superman. He has the power to wipe out the entire human race, and if we believe there's even a 1% chance that he is our enemy, we have to take it as an absolute certainty. But he is not our enemy, not today and even Suicide Squad, if you want to throw that one in there. What if Superman had decided to fly down, rip off the roof of the White House, and grab the President of the United States right out of the Oval Office? Who would have stopped him? People see an untouchable figure who could do anything he wants, and they assume that he's going to take over the planet because the world is full of cynicism and bleakness and despair. But then, Superman comes along and proves everyone wrong. He could do whatever he wants, and what he wants to do most in the world is help people. Simple as that. Because of this inherent goodness that just radiates from him, Superman's presence alone has this beautiful ability to comfort and inspire others, and you can feel it when he arrives on the scene during the last big showdown right as things are looking rough everyone's tone turns positive the characters actually smile S superman did that just by showing up unfortunately there's some major dissonance here for me if superman had shown up in his classic red and blue suit yeah i would have been right there with everyone but He's inexplicably wearing a black version of his costume. It doesn't look very hopeful. It doesn't feel hopeful. It feels dreary and sad. And honestly, it feels hopeless. This suit hasn't been set up as an even more cheery version of his classic red and blue. The only other time that we see Superman wearing this black costume is in a vision sequence in Men of Steel. And that scene is not portrayed in a happy, positive tone, unless you're Zod, I guess, and are about to leave a comment about how much you love jumping into a ball pit of human skulls. No, this scene is dark and scary and sinister. And those are the feelings that I'm reminded of when Superman shows up wearing this suit in Justice League because that's what the Man of Steel made me associate that suit 
with. In fact, the only other character that we see wearing an all-black suit similar to this is, once again, Zod, the villain of Man of Steel and longtime viewer of this channel, apparently. Thank you for subscribing, you absolute monster. And to make it even more odd, the few times that we do see Superman wearing his classic red and blue costume in Justice League are right at the start when he dies and right at the end when he's evil. Which is a scene that I can't seem to find because the movie for me ends at exactly three hours and 40 minutes and there's nothing after that. It's so weird. So when Superman is good and heroic and powerful in Justice League, he's wearing black. And when he's weak or evil, he's wearing a colorful costume. It just seems backwards to me. And not in the fun way. Not like Bizarro backwards. That'd be fun though, I love Bizarro. Another strange thing is that the scene where he chooses the black suit is underscored with quotes from both of Superman's dads, Jor-El and Jonathan Kent. This scene is trying to tell us that the costume he's about to put on will visually represent both his human side and his Kryptonian side. But all that I see here is the Kryptonian side. What part of the black costume is the human side? I don't know. Apparently there's an interview where Zack Snyder said that he read a book that described humanity as the color black, so the blackness of the costume is what he intended to be the human side, but then in a different interview, he said that the black suit is a pure reference to Krypton and has nothing to do with Earth, or humanity. The black suit, it is sort of linked to his kind of the old world that he, I think it's a more direct relationship to his family. And it's in a lot of ways, the blue suit to me represents his kind of place on earth. So it doesn't even seem like Snyder himself is confident in what he wanted the black suit to symbolize, but at least we know he wanted it to symbolize something. And I tweeted all of my thoughts out about this when the film first came out, which again was a month ago, because I'm late to everything. Needless to say, I got a lot of responses to my thoughts. Uh, they mostly boil down to a handful of common rebuttals that I want to systematically address because they don't actually counter my critique and I'm, su I'm incredibly petty. I turned a tweet into a video so I can have the last word. I'm not reading the comments. Counter one, it's from the comics. This was for sure the most common one that I saw, right? The, the black suit is from the comics and clearly Zack Snyder uh, lifted it from those pages as a reference. Don't you know that? I'm gonna give everyone the benefit of the doubt because I'm not recognizable at all. Uh, I'm incredibly forgettable, in fact, but I do have a comic book YouTube channel that I've been running for nearly a decade and I've been reading superhero comics many years before that, even and so, yes, I, I do know that the recovery suit's from the comics. It's, I, I know it's from the comics. My question is, so what? Uh, Wonder Woman's Golden Eagle costume exists in the comics, however, the film still makes sure to explain it as the armor of Asteria and how important and meaningful it is to Amazonian culture. Aquaman's scaly orange suit is in the comics, but the film still takes time to frame it as a king's outfit symbolizing Arthur's long overdue acceptance of that role. One true king. Heck, the suit that Batman wears to beat up Superman in Batman very Superman, wow, that's an old reference, I don't think anyone understands that anymore, is definitely in the comics, but the movie still shows you why he needs it, because without it, paired with kryptonite, Superman can shred Batman to bits just because. A costume is in the comics does not mean it doesn't also need explaining in the film, especially when it's a purposeful costume change. Superman could have used his blue and red costume, but he chose not to. He chose the black costume. Why? It's never explained in the film. I know that it's explained in the comics, and I know the explanation, but not everyone does offhand. So you know how people complain that we don't need to see Batman's parents being killed on screen anymore? That's because culturally, we've seen it so much that it's nauseating. <laughs> Most audience members don't have that same understanding and recognition for the black Superman costume. People broadly won't recognize the comic book explanation for why it exists the same way that they inherently understand Batman's tragic origin. But guess which one Snyder chose to keep in when he was making these films. Now, I want to be clear here. It is 
totally fine if these films were to sneak in Easter eggs that only the comic fans will really get. Take the octopus playing the drums in Aquaman, for example. I loved that. The history of Topo was one of the first videos I ever made on this channel back when I looked like a little ghoul. But this musical cephalopod is not an actual plot point of the film, so it doesn't need to be explained. Superman's black suit is a plot point. It's never explained. And all of this doesn't even get to the larger point, which is that just because something is lifted from the source material doesn't make it good or even give it an automatic pass. I got responses to my tweet of people saying that I, Scott Nicewander, have whined about comic book accuracy for years, and now that Snyder is giving us exactly that, I'm turning around and complaining again. What a hypocrite I am. But I've never demanded comic book accuracy from any movie or show. I've certainly questioned some choices, but I don't pitch a fit if things aren't a perfect one-to-one -one from the comics. I thought that I would hate Jason Momoa as Aquaman because I was worried he'd play the role like he did Conan the Barbarian or that one guy from Game of Thrones. I still haven't seen the show. No spoilers. Rooting for that guy. But as it turns out, I love Momoa as Aquaman. I think he's spectacular and fun and charming, and I'm glad that we didn't get a comic accurate version of Aquaman. And I have Batman v Superman and Snyder to thank for that. Hear me saying good things about Zack Snyder because... There's also a trend in his DC films of presenting a new take on the character while paradoxically expecting the audience to project their preconceived understanding of that character to fill in the big blanks in storytelling and character arcs. I shouldn't have to say this, but you can't do both. You can't say, let me make a film about my take on this character and then leave out narrative details, expecting people to read the comics to find out more about that character that you're doing your own unique take on in the first place. It doesn't make sense. But hey, if you are the kind of person that likes things to be accurate to the comic, then, well, first of all, you probably don't even like the red and blue costume that he wears throughout the franchise because it's missing those incredible, iconic red trunks. They are crucial. But more to the point, you probably wouldn't be a fan of the black suit either. Why does it have a cape in the film? The comic version doesn't have a cape, it's just the tights. And how come Superman doesn't have a mullet like he does in the comics? We demand a mullet for Superman. If only there was a hashtag campaign for that. Oh well. But let's talk a little bit more about the suit from the comics, though. It's referred to as the recovery suit. And in the comics, when Superman dies and comes back to life, he's incredibly weak and frail. Unlike me, these abs are real abs that I have. But this brings us to counter two. The recovery suit absorbs more sunlight, which Superman needs to restore his powers. Yeah, so Superman charges up his powers from our sun's solar rays, and black is a color that absorbs in a lot of light. So this all black suit helps recharge Superman faster because again, he's profoundly weak after coming back from the dead, and the Justice League doesn't have a lot of time to beat Steppenwolf. And hey, look, to Snyder's credit, he does show Superman soaking in the sun after donning the black costume in Justice League. Excellent! Great! I love that! Here's why it doesn't work, though. Superman comes back from the dead in this film and is immediately powerful enough to beat the entire Justice League shirtless. He's shirtless. The rest of the League has clothes on, except Cyborg, I guess. I'm always dressed. My point is, why does Superman need a recovery suit if he's totally fine? He's disoriented, sure, but it's not like the suit uh, helps him with that either because he chooses to wear it after his mind snaps back to normal. Plus, there was this scene in Batman v Superman where Superman is caught in a nuclear bomb explosion that leaves him visibly weakened. He needs to soak in the sunlight to recover. And guess what? Superman can do that in just his regular old red and blue costume, becoming fully restored in mere moments. He was shown to be weaker here than he was when he came back from the dead in Justice League. And he's still able to absorb enough sunlight to recover 
without a special black costume. But okay, if Superman needed to absorb the sunlight in Justice League to be even more extra powerful than he already was, then maybe, maybe I could accept that explanation. The problem is, he wasn't shown to be any more powerful than he already was. I mean, I, he blocked Steppenwolf's axe with his body. Is that what he needed the sunlight for? It seems like he could have done that anyway. He could have done that shirtless if he wanted to. He did a lot of stuff shirtless. Could have done that as well. More shirtless Superman. That's what these films really need. And if Superman did in fact need the black suit to power him up for the Steppenwolf fight, then why does he continue wearing it when he's back out and about as Superman on the daily? Once again, what it boils down to is that the film gives us no explanation for the recovery suit's necessity. Counter three. Do you really need it spelled out for you? I mean, do you really want exposition for everything? Exposition sucks. And hey, you know what? To an extent, I agree. Exposition isn't inherently bad, but clunky and heavy-handed exposition can be a slog to get through in films. Take, for example, this movie. Huh, let's see, as I talk to my father who's still in prison for the murder of my mother, which he didn't commit. Yeah, how did I get interested in criminal justice? Am I saying that I wish we had even more clunky exposition to explain Superman's black costume? No, of course I'm not saying that. You could show the black suit powering up Superman without a single word of dialogue explaining it. If, for example, Superman was at least a little bit underpowered before putting it on and the suit was shown visually powering him up as it was hit with the with the light of the sun something like that it would have been great show me how this black costume does anything inherently different than his red and blue one because so far the films have not this makes it feel like the only reason it was used in this movie is that it's from the comics and it looks cool. And we're back where we started. Which, hey, fair enough. If Clark just wanted to wear the black costume because it looked cool, then whatever. I just wish the film didn't set it up as this big moment where choosing the black costume is somehow meaningful and important when the film does nothing to explain why it's meaningful and important. So I thought of something while I was editing this part of the video, not to make it longer than it already is, but I'm reading a book called Wired for Story, and the author, Lisa Crone, discusses Ulysses, a book that readers love to tackle because it's a very long and hard read, that making it to the end feels like a testament to your endurance. I know I got a similar feeling after watching a certain extremely long comic book movie recently, but the problem is it's doubtful that many people are ever emotionally moved by Ulysses. They just like the challenge of getting through it, even if they don't actually enjoy reading it. And this outcome can send the signal to prospective readers that literature is terribly hard to read. And the way to write a good story is to make it intentionally hard to read. This idea has created a school of thought in writing that it's the reader's responsibility to just get it, rather than the author's job to communicate it. So when readers don't get it, it's not the writer's fault, it's ours, apparently. This mindset can foster contempt towards the reader while absolving the author of any responsibility to be an effective writer. It turns reading a story or watching a movie into work, because now it's on us to dedicate the time to understand everything that the author refuses to communicate in their story. And I don't know, that's just not a mindset that I'm a fan of. But again, this is not going to be a negative video. It's the first video back that I'm doing for the year. It's about comics, it's about superheroes, it's what you guys wanted, so we're gonna end it on a positive note. So, here is my solution to all of this. Here is how we make the black suit make sense, using the visual metaphors that the previous films set up and using in-universe logic to serve a narrative purpose. I don't typically do this kind of script doctor stuff that's more Nando v. Movies thing, so I thought I'd give it a try. You ready? Here we go. Just have Superman be buried in the black costume. 
That's it. Would this require a retcon? Maybe? Uh, we did see that Superman was buried in regular human clothes in the previous movie, plus they dug him out of his grave in this movie in just those regular human clothes. But we don't even have to change really anything about that. Maybe Lois Lane buried Clark in both his human clothes and then under it, the Kryptonian black costume, thinking that it was some sort of a burial suit or something. And she wanted to have him wrapping both sides of his life in his death in kind of a poetic way. And again, we don't even need to see her do this. It was already kind of teased at the final moments in Batman v Superman. We see the dirt rise around Superman's coffin, implying that he is already in the process of healing and restoring his life all on his own. The problem is that the suit can't bring him back to life in its current state. I mean, it's under human clothes, in a closed coffin buried six feet under some dirt. So it hasn't had a lot of solar rays with which to resurrect Superman. So the Justice League really do need to dig him up and jumpstart his body using the mother box if they want Superman back quickly. This brings me to my next point. The scene where the Justice League revive Superman, it already takes place during sunrise, Lois is grabbing a piping hot cup of coffee as she heads out to visit Superman's memorial one last time. The day softly breaks over Metropolis as the League zaps the Man of Steel back to life. This is the perfect time of day for this scene to show off the black suit's unique powers. Just picture it. Superman returns to the land of the living, but instead of being shirtless, his human clothes shred off of him from the power of the mother box, and he's left wearing the black Kryptonian recovery suit that he was also buried in. Just like in the film we got, his mind still isn't all there yet. He's confused and disoriented, and he does his best to try and fight back against the Justice League, but this time, Superman is physically weak. Batman recognizes that Superman's attacks don't pack the same punch that he remembers. Flash can even get a few tricks over on Supes because Clark isn't fully back to his full speed yet. The Justice League can even restrain Superman, hoping that he'll snap out of it. Narratively, this is an important beat. The Justice League wanted to bring Superman back because he was going to be their big gun in the fight against Steppenwolf, and his presence will provide an upbeat morale boost as the symbol of hope in the darkness that they're facing. But now, an angry, noticeably weaker Superman stands before them, unable to provide either hope or the power they need to win the battle. The heroes get disheartened. But as they all quietly stand around Superman, hanging their head low that their plan to bring him back was all in vain, a sliver of sunlight peeks through the towering skyscrapers of Metropolis. A focused beam of daylight hits Superman's black suit, and we visibly see how the suit is taking in that tiny amount of solar energy and using it to power up Superman, because the recovery suit has this particular property of being extremely good at converting sunlight into energy. And I want the film to visually show the suit doing something extraordinary. I'm thinking like miniature solar flares wrapping around Superman, I think that'd be pretty slick. Now, if you really wanted to, you could have one of the science-y characters like Flash or Batman comment about how the suit must be uh, powering Superman up at an extraordinary rate. But again, I don't need that exposition. I just need the film to communicate in some capacity that this specific suit is infinitely better at absorbing sunlight than Superman's standard costume. We could even cut to Lois Lane looking at this scene, having the realization that the black suit she decided to bury Clark in has had repercussions that she didn't foresee. Clark has miraculously come back to life, but Superman is powering up. And he's about to charge back at the Justice League. And now is when we get the fight that we saw in Justice League. No one is a match for Superman. Flash, who just bested him moments ago, watches now as Supes is back 
at his level. The sun continues to rise, and so too do Superman's power levels. The Man of Steel increasingly becomes a greater danger every passing moment. The one thing the suit doesn't seem to be fixing is his mind. He's still disoriented and attacking without asking questions. It's scary and unsettling. There is no humanity in Superman's eyes. He doesn't look like the hero of Earth. He looks like a sinister Kryptonian threat. And that is perfect. It allows the black suit to remain consistent with what we've seen in The Man of Steel. The black costume still symbolizes these vibes of badness. Superman is in a black outfit, beating up the heroes. He's not himself. He's the villain of this scene, and he may as well be dressed like the way we've seen other Kryptonian villains dressed in this franchise to really hammer in that point. So, in short, Having the black suit help charge up a depowered Superman at sunrise makes the suit serve a narrative purpose. And having Supes fight the Justice League while wearing the black suit would help keep the black costume thematically consistent throughout this franchise by constantly being associated with dark, unsettling, inhuman vibes it's perfect. Now, Lois can still intervene and help heal Clark's mind, just like in the movie, that's totally fine. But there is one more problem that we need to solve. If Superman comes back to life wearing the black suit, then what would happen to the scene later where he goes into the Kryptonian ship and finds the black suit to put on? Like, do we just cut that out of the film and have Superman wear the black costume for the rest of the runtime? I mean, we could, and, and maybe we could give Superman a rad new power in the final battle against Steppenwolf because the suit is so charged up by solar energy. Like, remember his solar flare ability from the comics? That would be a ton of fun to see on screen. But I have a better idea, and it's a little silly, but stick with me. Superman goes to the Kryptonian spaceship wearing the all-black costume. We hear the voices of his two fathers echoing their sage wisdom yet again. Superman wants to don an outfit that reflects both his human side and his Kryptonian side. And again, the movies don't do a great job with planting what his human side is. So here's my thought. We get a flashback to this scene from the end of Man of Steel, where a young Clark Kent is messing with the hanging laundry outside. He puts on a makeshift red cape that flows in the wind, contrasting from his denim blue jeans. We also see the childlike whimsy of Clark pretending to be a superhero. This shot right here is not particularly subtle. There's actually not a whole lot in the Man of Steel that's particularly subtle, but it's still fun imagery. In my opinion, of course, it captures Clark's down-to-earth farm boy sensibilities while also setting him up to be something greater. And it's done with Clark whimsically playing with laundry. Superman reflects on this memory for a moment. And he smiles. Later, we see the Justice League fighting against Steppenwolf. The battle is looking hopeless. They can't win. Steppenwolf winds up to swing his weapon at an unprotected cyborg, but as the axe is about to connect, Superman lands on the scene, blocking the blow, just like we got in the Snyder Cut, except this time, Superman is no longer wearing the black suit. Instead, he's wearing his classic red and blue costume with one small addition red trunks on the outside of his pants. The icon is back, baby. Now, okay, I'm sure that I lost some of you, but let me explain why this works really, really well. To be honest, I didn't used to love the underwear on the outside of Superman's classic costume. So when The Man of Steel first came out, I was actually pretty happy that the movies finally did away with that silly design choice, because again, I don't really care about comic book accuracy 
that much. But my opinion has been swayed in the last few years. Do the red trunks look a little silly? Yes, they do. But that's the point. Superman is an immeasurably powerful alien with countless fantastical abilities and very few weaknesses. And he dresses in alien armor complete with a big swooshing cape. And all of this combined makes Superman feel unapproachable and even a little threatening sometimes. As we discussed, the past two films of what you can loosely call Superman's trilogy deal with precisely that. People constantly feeling threatened by Superman. That's what makes the red trunks work so well on his costume. Does it look as cool and sleek as the black suit? No, probably not, but that's the point. Superman wearing his red trunks is intentionally a little goofy, which helps him feel a little bit more approachable. And I want to be clear here that I am calling the classic suit silly in the most affectionate way. Superman should be a little dorky. That's what makes this otherwise threatening, powerful alien charming and comforting. I mean, look at me. You can't tell me that this whole thing you're looking at here doesn't put you at ease. No, I see it, it's the pose. So, in my ending of the Snyder Cut, Superman shows up to save the day dressed in full color and the iconic suit complete with red trunks and everything. It no longer feels like he's showing up to attend Earth's funeral, nor does it seem like he's showing up to appear like this big, threatening, strong alien like everyone thought he was in the previous films. Superman shows up to save the day as a beacon of hope, radiating inspiration and positive vibes to others. The Justice League see this, and they smile, because they know that with him there, they can accomplish anything. And we feel that too, because that, that is Superman. Oh, and just imagine the spectacular visual contrast with Steppenwolf, who's wearing obsessively spiky armor like he's clearly compensating for something. Calm down, dude. I mean, what a giant insult that would be to Steppenwolf trying to impress Darkseid. Imagine how humiliating that would be to Steppenwolf's legacy. For centuries, all anyone is gonna talk about throughout the whole universe is how the failed conqueror Steppenwolf couldn't land a significant hit on a guy wearing underwear on the outside of his pants like a big, smiling, goofy dork. Think of what that would do to the legacy of Darkseid's conquests. Rumors of this embarrassing defeat would be constantly circulating. I mean, you couldn't resist but spill that tea. Tea. Dang it! Yeah, that's so cold. Oh, yeah, that is a, uh, that's a, a super bummer. So. Now look, if you didn't really care about the color of Superman's costume and you enjoyed Zack Snyder's Justice League, you might be thinking, out loud in the comments, wow, this guy is so stuck on one insignificant detail. <laughs> I guess this shows how good the film must be if this is the only thing you can find to complain about. And hey look, here's the thing, you're not wrong. Overall, to be honest with you, I did like this movie a lot more than I thought I would. I didn't love it. Obviously. Plus, you know, none of my color critiques in this video matter because apparently the a true final definitive ultimate cut of Justice League is the same Zack Snyder cut that we got, but it's called Justice is Grey, and the whole film is in black and white. So if I had watched that version, I would have just assumed that Superman showed up at the end wearing his classic red and blue costume because 
there's no reason he'd wear a black one. Plus, you just gotta love a film about the most basic morality tale of obviously heroic good guys versus cartoonishly evil bad guys, where the definitive cut is called Justice is Grey. That makes sense. I thought the superhero movie was fine. I have a lot more to criticize about it than Superman's black suit, but I'm not going to. Okay, just uh, maybe a little bit. Indulge me for one last mini rant. 30 seconds on the clock, go. Why did Martian Manhunter not help at all with Darkseid? And why did he not introduce himself to Bruce as John Jones? You know, a less threatening name than saying, people call me the Martian Manhunter. What people? Why do they call you the Martian Manhunter? You flew off like that name was supposed to put me at ease. Imagine saying, I didn't help at all with that last battle to save the entirety of Earth, like at all, but I am an ally. You can trust me because I've earned the name Alien McHuman Murderer. And Bruce is like, yeah, okay, sounds legit. I have no follow-up questions. All right, I'm done. Also, this whole sequence sucks butthole. Before we close the video out for today, I just wanted to take a moment to soak in the new set, Exposed Brick. I finally made it as a YouTuber. But I would like to christen this new set with one final prop. If you know anything about my set decoration, uh, everything on these shelves is a reference to a previous video that I've made and I am particularly proud of. Let me know in the comments if you recognize some of this stuff. However, I realized that there's nothing up here that is a reference to my Bob Ross video. It's the longest video I ever made and I'm super proud of it, even though most of you slept on it. So I think I need a prop up here from that video somewhere. And I, I read your comments and I hear you. You want to see my finished painting. So here it is right here. And I swore in that video that I would never show it off to the internet, but I think for you wonderful nerds, I will make that gigantic exception. I will make this painting a part of this set. So you can see it every time you watch one of my videos. And I think the perfect spot for this painting is right. Perfect. This is what you wanted. Thank you so much for watching this video. Make sure to like it and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And thank you to all the people who support me on Patreon, especially. I forgot to record this part when I was filming, so I'm just gonna read them now in voiceover. Edwin Latour, Donna Bark, Eric Totoro Pato, Havelock Smiggles, a name that I never get tired of saying, Jonathan and Megan Pearson, Jonathan Lenowski, Everett Parrott, Christopher Lang, Amanda Trisdale, and the rest of the wonderful nerds who keep this channel going over at patreon.com slash nerdsync. My goal this year is to hit 2,000 patrons, which I know is a lot, but 2,000 of you even giving just $1 per month would mean so much to me and this channel's future. You can also support me annually over there if that is more appealing to you. Either way, link is in the description down below if you wanna check out how you can support my work here. Thank you so much in advance. I will not be reading the comments under this video, mostly because I don't want to give Zod any more attention, but if you want to watch another video where I talk about Superman a whole bunch, click or tap right here to learn the secret reason why Superman smashes a car on the iconic cover of his first comic. It's fascinating stuff. Or here's a video that YouTube's algorithm recommends. Once again, my name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. See ya.